Thomas Silverstein was a serial killer. One of the few who became one while in prison. He murdered a correctional officer while at the United States Penitentiary, Marion, Illinois. I was a guard there at that prison for over 23 years. I started there in January of 1989, so I was not present when Silverstein was, but many of my co-workers were, and they talked about that day as if it was last week. Perhaps in their minds it was last week. Traumatic events in a person's life may remain crystal clear for many years. We're going to go over in gruesome detail some of Silverstein's many murders. We shall also talk about the disgusting people he had had for parents and the almost unspeakable abuse he suffered at their hands. Yes, I have photos of his parents and many others in his life. These photos are unavailable anyplace else that I know of to the general public. I had to do a lot of digging to turn up these images. My training as a detective has finally come in handy. One source I found especially handy was a book by Pete Early titled no human contact. I left out the details that Mr. Early covers very well in his book. For a serious student of Silverstein, I recommend Mr. Early's book. I have it uh, on a link for Amazon in the notes below if you want to buy it. The same author has written more than one book on federal prison from the point of view of the prisoner's experience. All excellent reads. Last, I would like to thank the Federal Bureau of Prisons for taking years to respond to my requests and then giving me less than half of what I asked for. A fine example of government transparency and responsiveness to the public who employs them. Now, a word on my perspective. I'm not a neutral player in this story. I have a definite opinion that will seep through in my narrative. I make this video against the wishes of many of my co-workers. More than one has threatened to beat me up for this video in particular and my channel in general. It seems that they feel that what happens at USP Marion is a secret. Everything about Marion should remain a secret. And that only snitches tell these stories outside of our small circle. I've been accused of being an inmate lover because I see prisoners as human and that they have the basic rights of all men. This is not to say that I think Silverstein was treated unfairly. It's my belief that he, and many others at USP Marion, should have been put to death. There's no reason to keep a man locked up for 30 years or more. He was a danger, and the best way of keeping him from killing again is to execute him as soon as possible. Decades of appeals is only denying justice and allowing another opportunity to make yet another family a victim. On the other hand, I will not bore you with my philosophizing about what a reprobate Silverstein is. You should know that by his story. Now that we've gotten past the preliminaries and all that stuff's out of the way, let me introduce you to the star of this real life horror show. There are many misconceptions that I wish to clear up. Thomas Silverstein, even that name is wrong. His real name was Thomas Edward Conway. He was named after his father, Thomas Ellsworth Valentine Conway. It was rumored back in Oklahoma that daddy was one of the members of a 1930s bank robber gang but was protected from the law by his neighbors, you know, like Ma Barker and Pretty Boy Floyd were back in the day. There was no love of the law, and the rich men who had money back in the, that time and place. His mother was Virginia Price. She was a wannabe movie star. She was able to get a bit part here and there while she was still pretty, but it really didn't pan out very well. She claims to have met Paul Newman and Joan Crawford. She met her future husband in 1951 when she was 19 and he was 20. A match made in hell if ever there was one. He was an army vet who was kicked out for starting a fight in a bar in Japan and then going AWOL until the authorities caught up with him. In less than a year after they married, he started beating his wife. 
Now, I don't mean he slapped her a couple of times and she yelled and somebody called the cops. No. I mean, he beat her so bad in July of 1952 that she had to have surgery to reattach her ear that was mostly torn off. The incident made the newspapers, but the judge released him because his wife said he was needed at home to raise little baby Tommy. Soon the couple was back in the papers for battling it out again. This time it was Virginia who got the upper hand when she smacked her husband upside the head with a lead pipe. Rather than kill her husband, she only knocked him unconscious. Later, she ran over him with the car after he smashed the windshield with a rock as she was driving straight at him. He flew about 15 feet in the air after the car struck him, so it seems she had gotten up quite a head of steam before she got him that time. She was driving around to, make, to, to run him over again, but some bystanders got to him first and dragged him to safety before she could finish the job. Her family bailed her out of jail, and her husband beat her so bad that she was taken to the hospital again. When he made bail, she got out of the hospital, and rather than face the music in court for all the shenanigans, they decided to go on the run together. You know, nothing like two lovers on the run from the law. Romantic, ain't it? He forged a check, dropped little Tommy with his uh, family near Tulsa, Oklahoma, and tried to stay out of sight of the law. It lasted about four months until old Daddy Conway got into a fight and somebody called the law. The two fugitives were taken back to L.A. to face the judge over the beatings and running over with the car stuff they had done before skedaddling. The judge was remarkable in his leniency. Both pleaded guilty to much lesser charges than attempted murder, but still got a year in jail each. Virginia was so shocked that she'd not be going, allowed to go home after attempting to kill her husband that she fainted dead away in the court. The newsmen were there to get a photo of Virginia's mo mother helping her recover her senses on the floor of the courthouse. The newspaper made a sensation of the battling Conways as they were known in print. Pretty blondes and rough husbands sell newspapers in the Los Angeles of the 1950s. Because Mrs. Virginia Conway caused such a scene at sentencing, the judge added four years of probation to her sentence. Now one stipulation was that she take good care of little Tommy or the judge would revoke her probation and send her to prison. He further said that he didn't know if he was doing the child a favor or not by leaving him in her custody, a newspaper reported. Little Tommy bounced from grandparent to grandparent while his parents served their sentences. Virginia finally had enough and filed for divorce while they were both in jail. In 1954, the local newspapers seemed to take up a lot of space with the Conway's divorce. The papers told how each accused the other of putting them in the hospital. He said he was in critical condition three times. She said he tried to stab her. He said after you stabbed me and on and on. She even lunged at him while they were being led back to jail. He took a swing at her until the bailiffs broke it up. A reporter asked Virginia if there would be any reconciliation after jail and she said that that was not possible. She'd learned her lesson in jail and even took the time to write a screenplay of her life while there. Now I'm unable to find a copy of this document and would love to see it if anybody has one. My email is in the show notes for anybody who wants to write. In April of 1955 the couple was back in the papers for fighting again not long after Tom disappeared. Virginia told her son that her father got drunk and robbed an LA bank, gave her a pile of cash and took off to lay low until the heat was off. He didn't do a very good job of it. He got busted in less than a year for burglary. This time he got 16 years in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Virginia got the divorce and full custody of their son. Now we change scenes. 
1955, Long Beach, California. Sid, as he was called, had a job with Ford making cars. He got the job by applying every day for two weeks. They liked that kind of determination at Ford and hired him right on the spot. He could now stop living in his two-seater British sports car and live in a building with a real roof and walls and everything. He chose a house not far from work. Who showed him the place, you ask? Virginia Conway, of course. Meeting a man with a real job and the ability to afford a house, she put the hooks on him. By the end of 1956, she got him to propose. In February 1957, he adopted her son, Thomas, and now the boy had a new last name, Silverstein. Tommy Silverstein's childhood was something out of a horror story. His drunk mother beat him for any offense, no matter how slight. His father was weak and controlled by his alcoholic wife. The whole extended family felt sorry for little Tommy, but nobody could tell the mother what to do with her child. Once Tommy was given a bloody nose by another kid at school, and Tommy's mother caught the kid after school and made Tommy beat the kid up. The next day was the kid's father's turn. He caught Tommy and dragged him to his backyard so his kid could beat Tommy up again. Having heard what happened to her son, Tommy's mom went to the house Tommy got beat up at and threw a brick through the window while making threats about what she would do to the father. He stayed in his house. She called the cops and wanted the kid's dad charged with kidnapping, but the cops knew Tommy's mother. They did nothing, probably because she was drunk and talking incoherently as she did much of the time. Tommy stole his principal's car. He set the family sofa on fire. He held a shotgun to his mother's sleeping head and pulled the trigger on the gun he thought was loaded. He hanged the family dog. He beat up his stepdad. His mother once smashed a mirror on his head to save her husband from Tommy's wrath. He ran away, heading to Mexico, but was caught by the railroad police. He was violent and out of control as a teen. He spent more days in juvenile hall than high school. Juvenile hall was an education in crime for Tommy. He learned to hate blacks because one stabbed him in the face in a dispute over a girl. And the cats are fighting. You see, boys and girls were housed at the same facility, separated only by a fence. Once a week, co-dances were held. He noticed that black and Hispanic people stuck together in fights, but whites didn't. White detainees were always outnumbered in juvenile hall. He earned his way to the California Youth Authority, kind of a prison for teens, too dangerous to house with other juveniles. He smashed out the back window of a moving pickup truck and tried to smash in the heads of the two boys who were having sex with a girlfriend of one of his classmates. The classmate didn't like Tommy, but asked for help when he couldn't beat the two boys who took his girl away from him. It made Tommy feel powerful to have snooty pretty boys ask for his help. Before her high school ended, Tommy had gotten a girl pregnant and then married her. His parents helped pay for their first apartment. He started popping pills and drinking heavy. He lost his job in construction and started robbing stores with his sister-in-law for, you know, spending money. When he got locked up, he had to fight a black inmate. Sent to the hole, he was a witness to sexual assault nightly by another prisoner. The guards ignored the pleas for help of the abused prisoners. Released from the hole, a half dozen black prisoners beat Tommy so bad he was hospitalized. He left that jail with the double S tattooed right here on his neck, a Nazi symbol meant to represent racist white power. A short time later, Tommy started to beat his pregnant wife. He choked her to the point of passing out. After the child was born, he decided to rob a KFC and was caught. The girl behind the counter was a classmate of his. The cops stopped his car less than a mile 
from the robbery because he had forgotten to remove the undershirt on the license plate. He put the shirt on the plate because he didn't want anybody at the restaurant to see his license number. In the excitement, he forgot to take it off. He was sent back to jail but escaped three days later. He, his wife, and the new baby went on the run and hid out in a cabin in the woods. One night, while the baby was crying, she noticed it suddenly stopped. She saw Tommy holding his hand over the baby's mouth and pinching the nose shut, you know? She grabbed a knife and told him to stop or she would stab him. Later, she had her brother pick her and the baby up and she fled, pregnant again. Tommy was furious and demanded the family tell him where his wife was, but they kept the secret. Tommy's biological dad got out of prison and he uh, reconnected with his family. Virginia was happy to see her ex. Tommy was delighted he had somebody to talk to about beating his mother, robbing stores, and beating up black men. Tommy was still addicted to heroin, so one day he was beating his mother, demanding money, when his little brother called the cops on him. He didn't hang around his mother's home uh, much after that. Tommy and his long lost dad found Tommy's ex-wife and he visited his children. One kid, the boy, he'd never even seen before. At the end of one of the visits, Tommy robbed a store and beat the clerk. His wife knew the clerk and told Tommy, don't come back. A year later, the FBI showed up and had photos of Tommy and his biological dad. The family said they had no idea who the people in the photos were. But after talking it over, and deciding that Tommy would kill or get killed, they decided to turn him in. The mother that beat Tommy for snitching and told him it'd be better to die than snitch was the first one to rat him out and send him and his father to prison. Betrayed by the person who told him his entire life to keep quiet and never help the police was handed over on a silver platter to the FBI. Thieves have no honor Nobody knew it then, but it was a life sentence. Based on his record of violence, Silverstein was sent to San Quentin, California's most violent prison at the time. They had a race riot that lasted a half hour and left six dead, three prisoners and three guards. The prison went from a bunch of strong individual prisoners running a joint to prison gangs. The Black Gorilla family, the Mexican Mafia, others. Finally, the Aryan Brotherhood came onto the scene in the 1960s. Silverstein had three years to do in prison for the state of California, and when that was finished, he had 15 years to do for the feds. With the gangs came an escalation of violence. The ABs only had about 20 inmates, 20 members, but was responsible for the majority of white on black violence in the prison. In the 1970s, there was over 500 stabbings a dozen correctional officer and 100 prisoner murders, all the result of one or another gang. Marijuana and heroin were the currency in the joint. A gram of heroin could pay for a murder. Tommy was addicted to heroin and claimed it was easier to get in prison than it was on the street. He claimed the guards or visitors brought the stuff in. While at San Quentin, he was diagnosed with an anti-social personality. Silverstein claimed that was because he was not a butt licker like all those other people who were in charge. The prison time in California up, Silverstein was sent to Leavenworth, Kansas, America's oldest penitentiary. Started construction in 1907, it was built by the prisoners it housed. Inside its four foot thick walls were 22 acres. It was a self-contained city inside those walls. A population of over a thousand prisoners were the permanent population and the COs or guards commuted daily. A word here about the correctional officers. Most get all kinds of offended if you call them guards. You know, I could care less. The courts call us guards. The average person calls us guards. It's all in a name. I'm not so hung up on titles. Personal assistant or secretary. 
sanitary engineer or janitor. If you're small, so small as to be hung up on titles, then you worry about stuff that makes no difference. I could care less if people say, guard. I am a guard. Or I should say I was. Now I have a better title. I'm retired. Now we'll show, uh, we shall uh, have a short history lesson of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Today, there is no such thing as a level one or level six facility. Nowadays, they have administrative max and low security. In my day and the time that we're talking about in this little adventure, the BOP, as they were known, had a level one to level six number assigned to each facility. Level one was for nonviolent small time crooks. Level six was for the worst of the worst. Long sentences and a proclivity for violence. John Gotti was the only prisoner I ever knew who was sentenced directly to a level six. All the other prisoners earned their way up to a level six, not by following the rules of the level five penitentiary. They were the pain in somebody's ass. USP Marion was the only level six in the history of the BOP. Even Alcatraz was designated a max penitentiary. Marion gave the wardens of the BOP the ability to get rid of that one guy who was a real problem. Everybody sent their problem child to Marion, but all the bad apples, put all the bad apples in one place and keep a close eye on them was the thinking. When Silverstein got to Leavenworth, his first celly was a guy I knew well, Edgar Hevla Jr., known in the prisons as the Snail. Don't ask me why, but most prisoners and even most of us guards were known by some nickname. Mine was Double Knot Spy. I worked with the Shitterbrush Sammy, the Rain Man, Black Cloud, I could go on and on. On 17 February 1979, while at Leavenworth, Silverstein killed his first man in prison, Danny Edward Atwell. The reason for the killing was first of all to set an example to the other prisoners. Atwell's girlfriend was sneaking in heroin in condoms stuffed into her vagina. Atwell was concerned that if there was any kind of leak, his girlfriend would OD and die. So he said. So he told the A.B.s that he would only smuggle marijuana. That sealed his fate. Nobody says no to the A.B.s and lives. Silverstein needed to make his bones to join the gang, so he was chosen to be the stab man. Hevla and Charles McAvoy, known as the preacher, would uh, help ambush and murder the victim. Here's another myth. I'd like to dispel. Prison murders are rarely man on man. Usually a group that gets an unsuspecting victim into a position that he is unable to defend himself from. Then a group of self-styled hero warriors beat and stab the victim dozens of times. Many times the victim is stabbed until the killer is unable to push the knife in again due to exhaustion. Screaming in pain, the man may beg for his life. Usually this results in his killers laughing at his pain and predicament. There is no mercy. There were two guards who heard the victim uh, identify Silverstein as his killer before he died and two prisoners who overheard Silverstein plotting the murder. Should have been an open and shut case, right? But Silverstein got an attorney that took uh, the testimony of the witnesses apart. Later, the Court of Appeals overturned the case and the surprising part was one of the prisoners who testified against Silverstein later confessed to the murder himself. Now prosecutors were sure that the confession was on orders of the AB. You know, confess to what Tommy done or your next bitch. Perhaps it's true, I don't know. Stranger than that's happened in prison. Now about the time that uh, Atwell was killed by Silverstein, Another murder took place with Silverstein's name all over it. Silverstein was a member of the commission by now, the leadership committee of the Aryan Brotherhood. Another member was Barry Mills, known as the Baron. Mills was then doing time at the U.S. Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. A prisoner by the name of John Sherman Marsloff 
was also in Atlanta. He was a bank robber with a long prison sentence before him. Marsloff was doing a heroin deal at Leavenworth for Silverstein and kept all the money for himself rather than give Silverstein his share of the proceeds. This made Marsloff a marked man. The word went out that he'd stiffed a member of the commission. Mills picked up the contract and killed Marsloff when he was transferred to Atlanta before Silverstein could kill him. At trial, Mills made a real mess of his defense. Defended himself. He claimed that there was no such thing as the Aryan Brotherhood. It had fizzled out when it moved from California system to the feds. The government had evidence that not only the ABs made the transfer to the feds, but that Mills himself was the originator of the ABs in the federal system. He claimed there was no such thing as a three-man commission, and that the government's witness, Ernest Holliday, known as Danny, was a plant of the prosecutors pretending to be a member of an organization that didn't exist. According to Holliday, he and Mills were just gonna rob Marslov, but Mills produced a sword and almost cut off Marslov's head in the attack that followed. Holliday was the first of the ABs to break the death before talking oath. It was a tantalizing glimpse for the public and us inside this secretive prison gang. It was also a death sentence for Holiday. The BOP sent him off to its internal witness protection program to keep him alive. He officially stopped existing. Even a casual inquiry by the public for any information would lead to an investigation. Holiday was sent to a state prison and kept in a special protective custody unit. There was a riot about five years later and all the prisoners in the protective custody unit were murdered. Holiday was stabbed dozens of times and his body was hung by the neck. That's why they found it. It was a clear warning that snitches get dead in prison. It might take a while, but the ABs will find you and they will kill you. Mills was given a life sentence for the murder of Marsloff. Silverstein said he had nothing to do with the killing. He never contacted Mills. He never asked anybody to be killed. There's no such thing as the Aryan Brotherhood. <clears throat> when Silverstein was transferred to USP Marion, he met a guy who had heard all about him and wanted to join the ABs. His name would also go down in BOP history, right next to his friend. He was Clayton Anthony Fountain. I won't waste your time here telling you all about him. I've already done so in a part, three-part series I'll put in the uh, video notes below. If you want to know all about him, watch this series after this episode. For now, I'll just say that he was an AB wannabe and the perfect match for Silverstein. A match made by Satan himself, if you will. I will say that Fountain got along with black prisoners until John Greshner, a prisoner I knew well, an AB member, counseled him that in prison he could have no black friends. Blacks were the enemy and may have to be killed at any moment. A white prisoner with a black friend could not be counted on to kill a black man when needed, and that made him a liability, even an enemy. Fountain had, at that moment, a black friend, and they had recreation time together. Henry B. Johnson, known as Pig, was a killer from D.C. and a member of the D.C. Blacks. When Fountain and his black friend were out for recreation one afternoon, Fountain had his throat cut by Johnson with the help of four other black prisoners. Rather than pull his own shank that was in his waistband, he ran to the officer's station and reported the attack. He was sent to an outside hospital and the civilian doctors sewed up his superficial cut. Things looked pretty bad for Fountain. He was attacked by his friend, a DC black, his injury was not life-threatening, and he failed to defend himself. Not only all that, but he was so weak as to run to the officers for help. The whites on the range lost a lot of respect for him that day. Then they found out 
He was a so-called white Muslim. Blacks in prison reject the white man's Jesus and adhere to the black man's Muhammad. Any white who tries to ingratiate himself with blacks might claim Islam as his religion. It was looking like Fountain was choosing the DC blacks over white prisoners. Now that'd make him a member of nobody's group. After the attack, Johnson was moved off the range. This prevented Fountain from retaliating. I'm sure that Greshner and the other whites were coming down on Fountain for being a weak bitch. He was looking like the kind of prisoner who could be taken advantage of because he couldn't fight back. Showing mercy and kindness at Marion was not done, not by the prisoners or the guards. Even the medical staff performed their duties in a detached way. Now, you might want your doctor to show understanding and compassion with your physical ailments, but not in prison. Even the doctor could be labeled a weak bitch, and everybody would try to take advantage of him. Now, I once saw a male nurse get shook up when an inmate cut an artery in his wrist and was shooting blood three feet out of his arm. The injury was so bad that I could actually see through the hole he had cut in his arm. The nurse was shocked into inaction. He just froze. And one of the guards had to prompt him with such things as, don't you think we should apply a dressing to the wound? And the nurse would reply, yes. Then the guard would say, don't you think we should take him to the hospital? Yes. You know, that, that was the reply each time. He said it with a, you know, like a dazed sounding voice. After both staff and prisoners hounded the man until he quit. He was last seen at a local hospital where he said some very uncomplimentary things about the staff at USP Marion. I'm sure we deserved everything he said about us. We can be rough on people who are weak. I was the first to suggest that he find a new job. A new prisoner replaced Johnson on the range. Charles Stewart, a DC black known as Steamboat Stewart, was doing 10 to 40 for assault with a deadly weapon. When he was charged with a brutal rape of an inmate over a three day period, he tied the man spread eagled in building 63 and sexually assaulted him several times a day until the guard found the victim. For this crime, Stewart was given another 15 years behind bars and sent to Marion. At first, Stewart was put in general population, but in less than a month, he was attempting to rape the other prisoners. For that, he was sent to the control unit. Most black prisoners from DC area identified themselves as Moors. Now, a Moor is an adherent to an uh, American offshoot of Islam. Blacks preferred not to be Christian since it was the white man's religion, and the white man is the oppressor of the black man. Therefore, the Christian religion is a tool of the white man to oppress the black man. Even the term DC black is not used by them, only the term more. DC black being the white man uh, oppressor's term for a strong black man. To make matters worse, Stewart was put into a cell number two. Now that's the cell next to the shower on the range. Fountain had to pass by that cell with a Stewart in it every time he had to use the shower, wearing nothing but a towel and, you know, carrying his toiletries. The old reprobate rapist just couldn't help but make comments of a sexual nature to Fountain as he passed by and while he showered. This made Fountain look even lower in the opinion of all the prisoners, but especially the white ones. Seeing the situation for what it was, Fountain had a choice. Align himself with the white prisoners like Greshner, a member of the AB Commission, or become a bitch for all the prisoners. Now there was a third option, but it wasn't acceptable either. Request protective custody. Fountain chose to follow the advice of Greshner. He was given a knife previously by the AB, but he failed to use it against Johnson when he should have. He would not make that same mistake twice. Fountain was in cell 10. Uh, the man in cell nine was Hugh Cologne, known as Baby Huey, and a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. Fountain and Cologne 
talked late into the night about the situation. As an aside, I'd like to mention I knew Colomb as well, and I'll make a video about him someday. Fountain was instructed how the Aryan Brotherhood kills. This is very noticeable pattern with them, and for the life of me, I can't figure out how the victim doesn't notice it when it's happening to them. Once, when the pattern started with me, uh, I approached Greshner and told him uh, I understood what time it was and would take steps to stop it. Uh, you know, if it didn't stop with me that very day, it stopped. Here's the pattern. A prisoner, especially a non-white one, would go from being ignored or despised to being all the AB's best friends. There's nothing they won't do for the new friend. They hang out together, they wreck together, they even share commissary with the victim. He's lulled into a false sense of security. It's called rocking him to sleep. When he's totally relaxed around his new friends and lets his guard down, the blow is struck. The victim is put in a situation he cannot escape from, cut off from all help. The attack is carried out with overwhelming force and without warning. One moment, everything is okay, and the next, he is being killed. For a few seconds, the victim even refuses to believe what is happening to him. He reacts with disbelief, not defensive action. By the time he understands the situation for what it really is, it's too late. He is on his journey to Valhalla or wherever his religion or lack of sends him. When the assault comes, it is with homemade knives called shanks, secured to the hands of the killers, usually tied or taped to that uh, knife so it won't slip from the killer's hands. A knife attack is very up close, personal, and very, very bloody. I've seen prisoners slip and fall in blood or lose the grip on the weapon because it was slippery with the victim's blood. To ensure the victim does not survive and later kill you, he must be stabbed as many times as possible. 30 or so is the least. And if it is possible to stab him 150 times, he is. Prisoners have become so tired stabbing a victim, they take a short rest break and then resume stabbing the corpse until physically restrained. I've seen this. It made me think of my own death at the hands of the prisoners. Being killed on duty as a police officer or a prison guard are two totally different things. It was only part of the job that only, you know, that I thought was uh, worse than being a street cop. One thing, uh, had to be accomplished before Stuart could be killed. Fountain and Colomb had to get at him. Locked in a cell, it'd be difficult to stab him. People stopped laying with their heads next to the bars for fear of being garroted. So, he'd have to wreck with Fountain and Cologne. They asked him, and Stuart consented. I think he would agree for two reasons. The first, would be that to refuse the invitation would be to show disrespect and the second is the, the sign of a coward. Both reasons can get a prisoner killed or a voluntary lockup in protective custody unit. The invitation was made and accepted. Usually that'd be the end of it, but because Stuart was a rapist of prisoners, it was very suspect his being invited to wreck with a couple of white guys. The request was forwarded to the control unit lieutenant for approval. He interviewed all three prisoners alone. He verified the signatures on the request was genuine and the prisoners did in fact want to wreck together. Now I have no idea what they told him, but he was convinced everything was on the up and up and the request was approved. How do I know the lieutenant was a him and not a her? Because before 1993, all correctional staff were male. Any female was escorted by male staff. I can just hear the gasps in the audience, but that's the way things were back then. Sexist or not, no females were allowed behind three grill unescorted by male staff. Usually two of them and both armed with nightsticks. When the appointed day came for the three prisoners to wreck together, arrived, a glitch in the plan happened. Fountain and Cologne were in their cells with their shanks tied to their hands and all pumped up for the kill. 
The guard opened their doors and they walked out onto the range with a towel over their hands concealing the shanks and the tape on their hands. Stewart was still in his cell claiming that he had not dressed yet. Fountain and Cologne walked to cell two as they normally would when heading out to wreck. For some reason, the guard believed that Stewart had gotten ready and opened his door. Colomb and Stewart rushed in, and Stewart could be heard screaming. Fountain blocked the door to the cell to prevent Stewart from escaping. A cell is a nice, confined area, and the victim can't run away. Despite Fountain's efforts, Stewart was able to exit the cell and head for the officer's station. It seems that in his final moments, Stewart wanted help from the same staff he insulted daily from his locked cell. Staff called for assistance, as per policy, and observed what happened next. They documented it in their incident report. Now let's stop right here and talk about staff response. Prisoners have been known to fake an assault, to lure staff into responding. Then all the prisoners on the range assault staff or take a hostage. We are prohibited from opening the doors and helping a prisoner, no matter how it looks to us. We must have a lieutenant on scene to be ordered to open the door. If in his opinion we have enough staff to deal with the situation, of course. Even then, I've seen staff overwhelmed when I thought we had uh, more than enough people on hand to deal with a given incident. But that's a story for another day. Back to Stewart running for his life from two white assailants on the range in the control unit. Having gotten past the uh, fountain and seeing that the officers on duty were not gonna help him, Stewart ran to the inside wreck area. There were a couple of exercise machines in the area. Stewart attempted to use one of these machines as a shield. Cologne went around one side and fountain the other. They had him trapped. He put up the best defense he could by blocking the blows with his arms and kicking, but against two armed opponents, he never really had a chance. On the African plains, once the lions get an animal down, they all pounce and give the killing bite. That's what happened here. Once they stabbed him and he fell to the ground, they both continued to stab him in as many, many vital spots as they could without stabbing each other. Fountain yelled, die you son of a bitch, as he and Cologne continued to stab him. The officers ordered both Cologne and Fountain to return to their cells, which they did after Fountain checked for Stewart's pulse. Finding none, both prisoners returned to their cells. Stewart's corpse was dragged from the range he had been stabbed more than 50 times. Both Cologne and Fountain were tried for first degree murder. They claimed self-defense. Six white prisoners claimed they saw Stewart pull a knife first. The six officers said it was Fountain and Cologne who attacked. Both were convicted of manslaughter and given a 10 year sentence to run consecutive with their current sentence. Now, this didn't add a single day to the time they had to serve in prison. But it did make them bigger men in the eyes of the white prisoners and the Aryan Brotherhood. Greshner even started going to wreck with Fountain, which sent a signal nobody could ignore. It seems that the judiciary are bigger enemies to the guards in prison than the prisoners are. This bullshit sentence did nothing to prevent future assaults or murders, as will be seen later. If anything, it encouraged violent behavior on the parts of the ABs. After the trial, there was a rumor that Fountain had given a note to the unit officer the day before the killing. Nobody can say for sure what the note said, but it seems likely that it was a warning of the killing to come. Perhaps it was telling where the shanks were in his and Cologne's cell. If the rumor was true, then the officers were as sick of Stuart as the prisoners were. If true, the prison and the prisoners would have found out. It may have ended with Fountain outed as a snitch 
against the ABs. One thing is for sure, Silverstein would never in a million years be friendly with a snitch. Perhaps the two guards would not have been killed and the end of the line level six prison never would have been born. Strange looking back at history, a small thing like a little piece of paper changes all that comes after it. Kind of like uh, Lee's plans found by a Union soldier before the Battle of Antietam. Same thing, just on a different scale. Here seems a, a good place as any to tell you about the control unit. When I was there in the late 1980s and early 90s as a guard, you have to have approval to work there full time. Now anyone could be assigned to fill in for a week or two, but to be assigned for a 13 week quarter, you have to have the approval of the unit team and the warden. When the events of this story were happening, I was told the exact opposite were true. In another video, I told that the guards of the control unit were the best Marion had to offer. They received special vetting and training. I applied for and was not allowed to work for an entire quarter in the control unit. Now a friend of mine told me that the H unit lieutenant may just have not wanted me there and told me a big cock and bull story about the special training and approval of the warden. Now, according to my friend, it was a story invented to keep me out of the control unit for whatever reason. I can tell you that I would dismiss his opinion, you know, just right out of hand. But an incident that happened later seems to make it true. When some of the control unit prisoners returned to Marion to face trial for a murder of an inmate, I was working in I Up or the cells above the hospital. That area was converted into a makeshift control unit. Only officers who had worked in the control unit were allowed entry into that unit. I was moved out and replaced because I had never worked an entire quarter in the control unit. But the person they replaced me with was hired long after the control unit had left Marion. He had never, not for a single day, saw a control unit, much less worked in it. So it lends credence to the opinion that I was just told a line of crap to get rid of me. One of the guards who was assigned to the control unit on a regular basis when I was there was so incensed that I said the control unit of staff was the best and had special training and was handpicked by the warden that he now wants to beat me up to this very day. The last time I saw him, he swore that one day he'd kick my ass for being a big mouth liar. Since I was not there on the day the two officers were killed, he seems to feel that my researching and talking about that day, the control unit, or prisoners involved in that unforgivable offense, and only a good ass kicking would start to make it right. To give full disclosure to his opinion of me, he uh, also said that I was never a good officer since I was an inmate lover and a piece of shit. He hates me to this very day, now, in his book, No Human Contact, on page 97, Pete Early said, quote, No place on the compound was as dangerous as the control unit, so Warden Miller made certain his toughest officers were assigned there, unquote. At this point in time, there's been so many lies told to me about the control unit that it's hard to say what the real truth of the matter is. I don't know who's lying, but it all can't be true. So I have it on good authority that the officers who were assigned to the control unit during the time frame depicted in this video were average at best and inexper inexperienced at worst. They received no additional training and what little training they did have was not up to the job they were doing. They didn't apply restraints correctly nor knew how to use riot, the riot batons that they were even issued. According to my detractor, the staff was an accident waiting to happen. To say otherwise deserves to have a Will Smith bitch slap on your lying mouth. His word and opinion, not mine. I was not there that day. I can only relate what the people told me who were there said to me. I can tell you that there was a story going around about one officer in the control unit who was a coward. 
And it was also documented in the paperwork that I got from the BOP as part of the research for this video. That is both sides of the story according to the staff I spoke with and the documentation I have. I only mentioned names of staff who were in one of Pete Early's books. So don't get your panties in a bunch if I say a guard's name in the clear. Now the physical area of the control unit. The door to the unit is located between the ranges on the left and on the right. It's about halfway up the unit, so to go to the upper ranges, C and D, you walk up a small flight of stairs, and to go to the lower ranges, A and B, you have to go down the same amount of stairs. There's a freight elevator that you stand on the top of as soon as you walk in the front door. Now on the left side, A range is downstairs and C range is upstairs. Uh, on the right is D range and B range is down. At the back of B range is four cells called boxcars. They're separated by a grill on the range and each cell has a solid wall and door in front of it in addition to the regular bars that all cells have. Each range has 18 cells, but cell number one on each range is a shower. All the ranges have two sets of bars we call grills. Between the cells on the front door, um, oh, yeah. All ranges have two sets of bars we call grills between the cells and the front door. At the back of each range is a door that can be only opened from the other side in case of fire. Now believe me, that door would never be open no matter how big a fire there was in a cell block. The two doors down ranges had a closet used as a law library. It had a few books and a typewriter for use with the prisoner's legal work. The front of the range, past the first set of grills, was a mop closet that had a big sink in it used to get water to mop the floor and also had a small spigot for extra hot water used to make uh, coffee and tea. Normally, if you were friendly with the orderly, he would get you a cup of hot water from that pipe. In front of the cells was a space about eight feet wide and then two rec cages. A rec cage was the area that the prisoners used for inside rec. It had a walk behind it and a space of about five feet to keep the prisoners away from the windows. It was supposed to keep them from damaging the glass, but it didn't work. They could damage the glass at any time they pleased. This cage was added later and there was not and was not there when Stuart was killed. I also have a very detailed description with drawings and photos of this area on another video about fountain. Silverstein tried to kill a mobster from Boston while on Sea Range. He decided to kill the man because Cologne was surprised that Silverstein expected him to do the killing rather than do the job himself. The mobster started screaming, Silverstein was trying to kill him. Cologne got frightened. He didn't do as he was told and started yelling that he would kill, be killed by Silverstein next. Both Cologne and the mobster went to protective custody and got out of the control unit. Silverstein went to the boxcars for 90 days on B range. The AB figured Cologne ratted out where they were keeping all the shanks and all the other contraband. If he was not going to be killed, after ratting out the ABs, Cologne was a man marked for death. When his time in the boxcars was over, Silverstein was returned to C range. This time he found a new prisoner, Fountain. At the suggestion of Greshner, Silverstein invited Fountain to wreck with him. They got along well and Silverstein decided to take Fountain under his wing and show him the ropes of living in the control unit, the last stop at the end of the line, prison. Silverstein was impressed that Fountain would kill another prisoner. That meant he was worthy of further training. He was told how prisoners would exploit you if possible how honor and loyalty is everything. The history, the glory, and the rules of the Aryan Brotherhood. The penalty for crossing a Brotherhood member and what it meant to become one. Blood in and blood out. You kill to become a member. And only death releases you from your Brotherhood oath. The Brotherhood protects its individual members, but the members must do anything the Brotherhood demands. As a kid, under the protection of Silverstein, a high-ranking member of the Brotherhood, 
Fountain had to do was he was directed. Robert Marvin Chappell was killed by Silverstein and Fountain while they were out on inside wreck. I have a video on this, as uh, you care to watch it, so I won't bother you with the details here. Let's just say that he was strangled, garroted, while he had his head leaning against the bars of his cell watching TV in bed. The reason no convict sleeps with his head towards the bars of Marion today. A good way for Fountain to prove his loyalty to Silverstein and the ABs, blood in. The body was found by a man I knew as a unit counselor. He was the sea range officer on the evening watch, 22 November, 1981, about seven years before I knew him. He was an observant man then and when I knew him. He was the one that found Chappelle's lifeless corpse in his cell. The cop killer would not be missed on our side of the bars. The race war that would take almost three decades to stop had started. It lasted my entire time at Marion. There were even times the prisoners tried to drag us into their racist nonsense. But most, but not all of us, were uh, immune from the infection of the racist the virus. I can name one white and one black officer that were as racist as any of the prisoners. For the most part, we kept an eye on those two and kept them in check. The black guard only hated the white guards, so it didn't really affect the prisoners at all. He's retired today and rants about the racist white oppressors on his Facebook account last I saw. I blocked him so I don't have to hear about how evil of an oppressor I and my kind are. The white one said he found that Jesus had no room in his heart for racism and said he was trying hard to emulate his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, I wish them both well. I will mention that one of the results of the murder of Chappelle was getting David Owens, known as Bionic, and Everett Van Burkett, known as Sonny, put in protective custody. I had them in G-Unit for years. Sonny was a homicidal maniac that makes Friday the 13th movies look like a children's show. I have a video about him as well. Briquet got a settlement from the prison riots in New York while I was working in G-Cell House one day. The Attica riots were in 1971 and he'd just gotten a payment in 1989. I wonder if the guards they killed got any money. Next on Sea Range was Raymond Lee Smith, known as Cadillac. He blamed Silverstein for the murders of Chappell and Stewart. He told anybody and everybody that he was going to kill Silverstein. I spoke with Eddie Griffin, a friend of Smith. He said the man was huge and as strong as they came. Mr. Griffin is out now of uh, prison and counsels youth in an attempt to keep them out of prison too. I have one of the only photos of Smith left in existence. Eddie Griffin said that he had not seen a photo of Smith in many years and was surprised I was able to get one. While Smith was screaming disrespectful racial epithets at Silverstein, he was also using language that included all the whites, which angered uh, all the whites on the range. Some of the other black prisoners would try to get Smith to stop but he had no time for them. He was going to kill Silverstein and didn't care who knew it. Smith went on a campaign of intimidation. Because Fountain was on the range, or what was one of the range orderly and a friend of Silverstein's, Smith shit him down, meaning that he threw a container of feces and urine in his face. Not a pleasant thing, I can tell you from experience. It tends to burn the skin, at least in my case. Silverstein walked past Smith's cell and a loud explosion took place. Smith had tried to shoot him with a zip gun, but he didn't have the skill to do it right and he only hurt himself. Next, a black prisoner walked up to Silverstein's cell and while they were talking, Smith lunged around the corner and tried to cut Silverstein's face. Smith got 30 days in the boxcars for that stunt. When Smith came back to Sea Range, Fountain and Silverstein had a little surprise for him. 
they, you know, something they'd been working on. They had cut the fence on the inside wreck cages and had a couple of shanks hidden there. When Smith came out on the range to shower, they broke the rest of the fencing loose and Fountain with his shank attacked Smith first. He missed and got stabbed in the chest. Silverstein then tackled Smith and took his shank away from him and used it to stab him. Smith fell to the ground and Fountain came over to help stab Smith to death. Silverstein wanted to drag his body down the range and cut his head off in front of the black man who had set him up to be stabbed, but the body was so slick from all the blood that he couldn't really do it. You know, the stabbing had taken a long time and the guards had gotten themselves all suited up in riot gear and were ready to enter the range to get Silverstein and Fountain under control. Seeing that there was nothing more to be done, Fountain gave his shank up to the officers at the grill and let them cuff him and remove him from the range. Silverstein gave his shank over to another prisoner and entered the shower to be locked up. Fountain was treated at the prison hospital for his puncture wound. Smith was dead from 67 stab wounds over his entire body. This incident is covered in another of my videos for a more in-depth look. Now, Officer Mer Merle Eugene Klutz told both Silverstein and Smith to leave each other alone before this, and if they didn't, one of them might end up dead. Klutz wanted peace in his cell house and not constant war. The offhand comment got Silverstein to thinking, why didn't they move Smith or him? How come they were allowed on the same range when Smith was telling anybody who would listen that he was gonna kill him? That Smith had tried to shoot and stab him. The plot to burn Smith in his cell was uncovered and still they were on the same range. Silverstein thought the guards must have wanted him killed. That officer Klutz so much as said so. This started the strange logic of a mentally ill man to conclude that he had to kill Officer Klutz to save himself. This is what Silverstein himself said. It is obvious logic of a man who is suffering from a deep psychosis. There doesn't have to be a logical reason for the mentally ill to lash out, just an illogical logic of their own. That is how some people today have convinced themselves that there are lizard people called reptilians living amongst us right now. They have their reasons for believing a total crazy idea. The same with Silverstein. His victim, Officer Klutz, did nothing to bring on his murder. The insane need, neo, need no reason. All the other rumors to the contrary are bullshit things that the uninformed say to try to make sense out of a senseless act. Believe the superstore of your choice. The fact is Silverstein was a whack job who invented reasons to kill. By 1983, Marion was becoming a very dangerous place for both staff and prisoners. Warden Miller started with the BOP as a guard at USP Alcatraz, California. He thought he knew hardcore criminals. You know, how they thought, how they acted. Now some thought the Aryan Brotherhood was a new concept the BOP didn't understand yet. Perhaps that was right. The ABs orchestrated work strikes. Miller closed the prison factory. Two officers were taken hostage and one was stabbed. I knew one of those officers when he came back to work 10 years later. Two officers were stabbed, one 17 times. They both lived, but word was out. That was just the start of the assaults on staff. Every time there was an assault on staff or prisoner, Warden Miller cut privileges. Once he even locked down the whole place for a month with no prisoner allowed out of his cell. It seemed to work. No assaults, and all was quiet for four days. Then an officer was attacked with a heavy metal mop ringer. Later, another prisoner was found stabbed to death in a cell. Officers were afraid to go to work. Some just quit. Others refused orders when they thought it put them in danger. The AB's whole command structure was at Marion. They were all 
They were doing all they could to put pressure on the prison administration, the guards, and even the prisoners to put them in charge. It has happened in some state prisons that the prisoners ran the place, not the employees. Warden Miller was doing what he thought was right to prevent that. Silverstein was angry at every new privilege that was taken, whether it affected him or not. He saw Officer Klutz as a tool of oppression. In Silverstein's mind, it was not a cop versus prisoner. It was Klutz, the man, versus him, the poor victim of another bully. Greshner advised Silverstein to let it go. Other members of the AB advised against killing a cop. He was truthfully told that we never forget, we never forgive. 30 years later, men who were not even born yet will hold a grudge against him for killing an officer. He didn't listen. He would regret not taking that advice. I have a video where he went on and on for page after page telling how sorry he was and what a miserably, uh, miserable life that he had for himself after that. 9.30 a.m., 22 October 1983, the control unit, B range, a place I know well. It's also called H unit. The name was later changed to Z unit and later still to special housing unit or SHU, S-H-U. I have gone into detail in other videos about Fountain's murder of an officer, but not about what Silverstein did in as great a detail. I'll do so here. Silverstein went to the shower. At the time, it was practiced to cuff prisoners in the front and not double lock the cuffs. Leg irons were not in use in the control unit then. That would come later. He took his usual long shower. It was about 10 minutes past 10 a.m. Silverstein announced that he was done with the shower. Per policy, three guards entered the range to escort Silverstein back to his cell. They were officers William McClellan, John Mahan and Merle Klutz. Silverstein was cuffed in front as always with, without double locking the cuffs. Officer Klutz followed the two officers who were right behind Silverstein walking on his own back to his cell. Then John S. Campbell, a prisoner in the control unit for stabbing another prisoner, yelled out that he needed to talk to Klutz about something important. That separated Klutz from the other two officers and sealed his fate. His escape route was cut off. A few seconds later, Silverstein stopped in front of Randy K. Gomez's cell. Gomez was in the control unit for punching a Marion officer in the face. In faster than I can say it, Gomez had unlocked Silverstein's cuff and handed him a 10-inch shank. One of the escorting officers said, look out, he's got a knife. Silverstein ran between the two officers and headed straight for Klutz. Klutz raised both hands and attempted to punch Silverstein. But like the unarmed victims before him, Klutz didn't have much of a chance. Silverstein started stabbing him as hard and fast as he could. Somehow, Klutz got past Silverstein and Officer McClellan grabbed Klutz and was dragging him off the range to safety. Just before the two officers exited the ring, Silverstein reached them and grabbed Klutz and jerked him back onto the floor where he started stabbing him again in a rapid motion. Officer Mahan had left the range in the initial attack and had armed himself with a riot baton. He used this to strike Silverstein in the side of the head and momentarily distract him. Officers Mahan and McClellan were able to drag Klutz off the range while Silverstein recovered from the blow to the head. Klutz was dead with 40 stab wounds. Silverstein was still armed and loose on the range. He said he'd kill anybody that came near him. He had a well-founded belief that he was going to be beaten or worse. Lieutenant Clyde Jones arrived on the scene. He persuaded Silverstein to drop his shank and return to his cell. Silverstein was reluctant, fearing a reprisal, and he wanted to go down swinging rather than take a beating meekly. The lieutenant said nothing would happen to him if he surrendered the shank and went back to his cell. Silverstein was strip searched 
in his cell and taken to the boxcars on B range. Nobody touched him. The lieutenant had kept his word. The warden was not at the prison or even available. The associate warden and the captain decided that this was a personal vendetta. There was no need to lock down the prison because the violence would not spread. AB members all over Marion was telling staff that more guards would be killed if Silverstein was hurt. Nobody was going to lay a hand on Silverstein, so that was not a consideration. It was decided to keep the prison running as usual and only lock down B range where Klutz had been killed. This choice, this choice is a study in never underestimate the determination of the mentally ill to cause as much damage as possible in a short period of time. At 8.20 that evening, Fountain murdered Officer Hoffman on C range of the control unit. I have a video series about Fountain and that senseless murder. See the notes for the videos. The aftermath and investigation. The director of the BOP sent his top man in Washington and the warden from Leavenworth to investigate what had happened at Marion. Director Carlton himself got in his car and started driving to Marion. When he arrived, he was given a report that the two-man investigation team had come up with. There was no reason the two officers had been killed. Silverstein and Fountain were in danger of retribution from staff and should be moved without delay. The Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood had intimidated staff at the prison and, were the, empl and the employees were paralyzed. The BOP was dealing with a type of prisoner not seen before. There was no death penalty. A murder was punished with another life sentence to a prisoner who was already doing life. Men committed multiple murders and were given parole 10 years after the last killing. It made a prisoner feared and respected to kill. There were there was only incentives to intimidate staff by threatening to kill them and given the chance to kill. Do it, since there was no real adverse action that could be taken against the prisoner, but add more time to a life sentence. The director immediately ordered Fountain to be sent to the BOP medical facility in Missouri and Silverstein transferred to Atlanta. The mood of the prisoners and the guards at Marion were grim. Both Hoffman and Klutz had sons who were officers at Marion, and both murdered men were well liked. Warden Miller wanted to keep the prison open and running, fearing that a prolonged lockdown would cause more violence than it prevented. The officers said that they felt they had no authority to control anything. The prisoners had no fear or respect of the officers at all. The top men in Washington, D.C. and Warden Miller discussed the situation. Miller wanted to keep the prison open to prevent more violence and to set an example to the 50 state correctional agencies. At the time, no state had a lockdown facility and if the feds had one, Miller was fearful it would set precedence for the states. He was right about that at least. The same week, as uh, that meeting, Jack Callison, a bank robber, was stabbed more than 30 times while going to his evening chow. Warden Miller ordered his officers to start searching prisoners in the hall for weapons. A prisoner objected to being searched and an officer grabbed him. A fight started between the officers and the prisoners. Prisoners started fires and broke windows. Things were going from bad to worse when the prisoners started telling officers they were the next to die. The director ordered the prison locked down. The guards started to call in sick in large numbers. Some just quit. Director Carlson removed Warden Miller and assigned him other duties. Associate Warden Cohane from Leavenworth was sent to Marion. The special operations and response teams from Leavenworth was under the control of Cohane with the mission to restore order by any means necessary. An additional 40 officers from other Max prisons were sent to help. Cohane started operations in the control unit. The prisoners were in 
full riot mode, throwing urine and feces at officers, setting fires, and throwing objects at anybody that they could. The SORT officers moved from cell to cell, cuffing inmates or spraying them with chemical irritants and rushing in to drag them out if they refused to cuff up and come out on their own. After the prisoner was removed from the cell, he was strip searched and a rectal exam was performed by medical staff. All the property was removed from the prisoner's cell and everything was searched for contraband and weapon. The first day, seven shanks were found in the control unit. The rectal exams found hacksaw blades, heroin, handcuff keys, and lock picks. All weightlifting and body building equipment was removed from the prison. Prisoners were not allowed to leave their cells except for court or medical appointments. Prisoners were strip searched cuffed behind their backs with double locked cuffs and leg irons. A squad of guards and a supervisor had to be present to open a cell door to take the prisoner to court or the hospital. All guards had to have a 36 inch riot baton on their persons at all times. Prisoners who attacked guards received injuries before being subdued. Some got broken bones while resisting. Prisoners arriving or departing Marion were given a rectal exam those resisting or refusing were injured, and the exam was performed on them anyway. Guards who were not issued riot batons because they were on back order were given a hickory axe handle to use. Prisoners were given four one-hour visits per month. The visits were non-contact, and they could look at each other through glass and talk on the phone. The officers listened to that phone. Personal property was limited to a small box of letters, legal work, and a few photos of their family. Excess property was destroyed. A pack of these liberal pussy lawyers uh, heard that the prisoners were being abused and got a court order to investigate. The lawyers claimed that Marion was experiencing a police riot and the prisoners were being beaten with clubs and abused in retaliation for the murders of Klutz and Hoffman. When Fountain and Silverstein were returned for trial, it was rumored that officers kept the two up with radio music at full volume all night long. And uh, they made constant threats to kill the two. Their food was spiced with metal shavings and broken glass. It was further alleged that the warden and the supervisors had little interest in stopping the harassment of the two killers. The guards were reported to beat on their doors for hours at a time with their nightsticks. Director Carlson said the harassment, if true, would have to end or the people would be prosecuted in federal court. Naturally, these were just allegations and nothing was proven one way or the other. Director Carlson testified before Congress that there were no beatings in reprisal. Yes, force had been used, but only that which was necessary to clean up Marion. So I guess that makes all the rumors of the beatings and harassment untrue. The director of the BOP said in sworn testimony before Congress, and as we all know, it's impossible for a government official to lie to Congress. Silverstein, Gomez, and Fountain were found guilty of murder. Silverstein and Fountain claimed self-defense. Gomez didn't know anything about how Silverstein got out of cuffs or had a shank. The judge gave Silverstein and Fountain 150 years sentences each. An appeals court reduced the sentence and all three prisoners were eligible for parole in 10 years. Neither Silverstein nor Fountain would ever see another day in the free world. Both would die in custody. Silverstein spent 36 years in solitary confinement and Fountain almost 21 years. They both were given the bare minimum that the law mandated they had to have to live. The guards refused to talk to them. They just sat and looked at them 24 hours a day with the lights on in their cell. 
Now and then a scream or some other noise from another part of the prisons that they were held in reached their ears, but no other sound. They lived alone, never unshackled in the same room as another human being for the rest of their lives. They were always watched, but rarely interacted with their watchers. Both said they regretted what they had done, but it didn't matter. We never forget, we never forgive the murder of a correctional officer, no matter how long it's been. Ask the ghosts of these two men and the Birdman of Alcatraz if you can. They'll tell you what I say is true. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, by all means, please hit the like button and subscribe. I promise it won't kill you to subscribe.